In an effort to prevent expensive shutdowns and unplanned maintenance downtimes, facilities across the globe today rely on a variety of preventive maintenance methods. Many studies indicate that temperature rise, otherwise known as hot spots, is a major cause for these failures. These abnormalities are often caused by loose connections as a result of vibrations, unbalanced loads, overloaded conditions, and a wide range of other issues often found in conductive environments. Most industries use either routine physical inspections or thermography programs to detect temperature abnormalities. Physical inspections require the user to open the electrical enclosure, barriers, and other insulating materials in order to inspect the connections. Since most facilities prohibit their personnel from this type of high-risk access, the data obtained is often inaccurate or unobtainable. Additional risk of failure exists when the equipment is not put back in the original condition after inspections. To overcome these shortfalls and to measure the temperature of the live conductors, some facilities use infrared cameras and windows. With this method, an IR camera is directed at a live conductor either directly or through an IR window to measure the rise in temperature. In some cases, the IR camera or the window visibility is restricted by the connection location and field of view of the IR window. To help you address these concerns effectively, we'd like to introduce our new Grace Sense Hotspot Monitor, or HSM, a continuous real-time temperature monitoring device intended for locations that are difficult and hazardous to access. This device not only measures the temperature at any given point in time, but also proactively monitors and enables the user to predict the failure before a potential shutdown. The HSM utilizes patented fiber optic technology, providing constant temperature data available in 9 or 18 independent sources. The fiber probes can be mounted onto electrical bus bars, bus ducts, transformers, or any other source of heat. The Hotspot Monitor provides a unique combination of patented fiber technology and advanced algorithms that convert the change in light intensity to temperature. The patented fiber probes securely connect to a ring-style connector that conveniently mounts to the source of heat, while the other end connects to the HSM module. Sources of heat may include inaccessible equipment and blind spots to IR scanning. The most obvious benefits of the HSM over IR thermography come from the continuous real-time monitoring feature. In addition, the successfully proven measurement accuracy of the probes is not subject to calibration errors, as can be the case with IR scans. The Hotspot Monitor comes with 16 megabytes of built-in memory for data storage. By connecting the GraceSense HSM module via Modbus TCP IP or Ethernet IP and accessing the Web Utility tool, users can configure the temperature thresholds, time intervals, and relay outputs. This tool further enables access to the real-time data logs and downloads the stored data for analysis and trending, connecting directly to the device or safely through closed doors using a GracePort Ethernet connector interface. GraceSense Hotspot Monitor is a reliable and affordable solution for use in environments with low, medium, or high voltage systems. The HSM is available in two versions, either a 9-point module with a built-in LCD display or an 18-point module. The unit comes fully kitted with fiber probes, ring-style connectors, and an installation kit. Optional accessories include a Modbus current sensor, high temperature probes, ambient measurement attachment, custom connectors, and fiber lengths of various sizes. Continuous Real-Time Monitoring, our answer to your most demanding and critical applications where guesswork and downtime is not an option. To learn more about our hotspot monitor, visit GraceSense.com or call 800-280-9517. Find faults before they find you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for, for showing up today and dialing in and listening to this presentation. Uh, or good afternoon if this is the uh, afternoon session. My name is uh, Jay Prigmore. I am a managing engineer and at a consulting company called Exponent. And I'm in the electrical engineering computer science practice. And I perform quite a bit of arc flash studies and I'm actually on the IEEE 1584 um, working group and was a voting member on this standard. So today basically the topic is going to be you know what changes occurred 
between the 2002 edition and the recently released 2018 edition. And there was a substantial difference, uh, although the, the end result is, is similar. But there's a lot of different things that occurred and different equations and the number of factors that have changed based on improved data and test data. So I'd like to welcome everyone here and I guess let's get started. So I wanted to kind of, before we get into the presentation, give a few takeaways or some, some uh, high level overviews and some, some thoughts to really emphasize as we go through this presentation. The first one is that the standard has changed significantly from the 2002 edition to the present 2018 edition. Uh, while the outputs may be very similar, the inputs have changed and a lot of the intermediate steps have also changed, including the equations. And there's, um, the equations are much more complex and accurate than they were prior because of the more test data. There's been a lot of extra additional tests and the equations were refined based on this empirical test data and also a statistical analysis that was performed. Um, additional information for each equipment model or each piece of equipment uh, may also need to be gathered that uh, is, a, you know, like I said, addition from what was done in 2002. And examples of that are the electrode configurations as well as like enclosure sizes. And there's correction factors that need to be taken into account when performing the arc flash analysis. So before we get into the background and some of the, the meat of this presentation, first thing I wanted to cover was the purpose of the of IEEE 1584. And they have a purpose statement in the document that basically you know, says word for word on the slide that it is, to, it is to enable qualified persons or person to analyze power systems for the purpose of calculating the instant energy to which employees or workers could be exposed during operations or maintenance work on electrical equipment, particularly ener energized electrical equipment. Um, so contractors and facility owners can use this information to provide you know, appropriate protection for employees. So what this means is they basically take the, the results of the arc flash analysis and you can then reference other standards such as NFPA 70E and determine what the appropriate level of personal protective equipment or PPE is for someone performing energized work uh, while you know doing maintenance or operations to work on a, on electrical equipment. So, so now that we know the purpose, uh, the next is to get a little bit of a of a background or a history lesson on IEEE 1584, and, and see kind of where the standard has ha has developed over time, and, and what changes have occurred, and why things were done the way they were done and why the new equations have been adapted and why they're a lot more complicated than the original 2002 edition. So IEEE 1584 basically provides a model and an analytical process that enables the calculation of what's a predicted incident thermal energy and the arc flash boundary. Basically what this means is it allows you to calculate the type of energy uh, at a specific distance away from the energized equipment should an arc or electrical arc occur. And it also provides, you know, arc flash boundaries of where a worker or a maintenance personnel or whoever is doing the work needs to rope off the area and secure the area so that any non-qualified person uh, doesn't encroach into the arc flash boundary, especially not wearing PPE and, um, you know, minimizes any sort of any sort of damage to that non-qualified person. It also provides guidance on on based on the instant energy levels, one can use like NFPA 70E or other other sources to determine personal protective equipment requirements for the person at that at that panel or wherever they're doing work at to properly protect themselves based on these calculations. Uh, it does cover the collection of field data, if applicable, and field data, whether it's, it's collected by the engineer or not, or whoever's running the study or not, um, the field data needs to be verified at some point, and, and if not, then one of the main assumptions you should, you should put in is that field verification was not part of your arc flash study. So you assume that the drawings that were provided were 
were true and accurate. And if they're not, then you know it might invalidate the, the incident energy analysis or the arc flash analysis. Um, one thing that also needs to be discussed is the number of operating scenarios and which operating scenarios are likely to be investigated. The ideal situation is you'd like to get it, all the operating scenarios, but there's going to need to be some input from the client on you know which operating scenarios um, you know they, they they could they operate in. You know, it might be a uh, just just a couple like a normal and a main. I mean, normal and an emergency, or it might be one source on, one source off, or both both sources on, depending on on how it's all how it's all configured. And then it also covers the parameters necessary uh, to perform these calculations. And we'll get into that in a little bit. But the application of this includes electrical equipment and conductors for three phase alternating current or AC voltages from 208 volts up to 15,000 volts or 15 kV. That's the, the bounds of this, this standard. So some things that IEEE 1584 does not cover is uh, single phase systems. Presently, the standard is strictly three phase systems. However, there are discussions and there has been some test protocols and test plans developed for uh, single phase systems uh, while we're in the when the working group meetings. Uh, they just they haven't been performed yet and they haven't actually been included in the standard. Doesn't mean that they're not going to be included in in a future revision. But the moment. The only guidance really on calculating the instant energy from single phase systems that's presented in IEEE 1584 would be to use this, the three phase equations and basically the results of the three phase equations are expected and anticipated to be conservative estimates and not you know, a more appropriate or more accurate estimates for single phase systems in particular. However, that conservative estimate you know, may require someone to wear a higher rated per, uh, PPE or, or safety equipment than what would nece necessarily be needed if it was an actual single phase calculation. 1584 also does not cover direct current systems or DC systems, but it does provide uh, a number of reference publications for anyone who's looking into doing a, a DC arc flash study. And it also does not provide personal protective equipment recommendations either or PPE requirements or PPE recommendations. You have to go to a different standard such as NFPA 70E to find those PPE recommendations based off of these incident energy calculations. So, so a little more background on IEEE 1584, uh, especially on the testing and the, uh, the tests that were done to perform, to calculate these or determine these uh, empirical equations used in the calculations. Uh, the 2002 edition was based on over 300 arc flash tests, and that was basically came from about $75,000 in funding from various sources. And these tests utilized a 20 inch or 20 cubic inch box or an enclosure. The 2018 edition, however, uh, ran an additional 1,700 arc flash tests. So the equations and the empirical data derived in 2018 is approximately, you know, 2,000 arc flash tests. So the 300 prior plus the 1,700. And the working group committee was able to secure about 3.5 million in funding uh, to perform these tests, although the desired amount was about six, six and a half million. So it fell sh relatively short of the, the requested amount, but still enough to perform all these tests. Uh, one thing to point out is the modeling is much more complex compared to the 2002 edition. And uh, one of the reasons why is there's, in the 2018 edition, uh, different types of electrode configurations and enclosure sizes were taken into account, along with uh, you know, various voltage levels and various current levels and a number of uh, variability in the test. A, kind of a uh, overview of which tests were performed in the 1700 test, or approximately 1700 tests, is shown in the table on the right. So we had about almost 200 tests at the 208 three phase or 240 volt single phase uh, test voltage. Um, had about 400 tests at the 480 volt 
system voltage, uh, 340 tests at 600 volt system voltage, 320 tests at 2.7 kV, about 200 tests at 4160, and about 275, 270 tests at 14.3 um, kV. So this is kind of the test voltages that were performed in the 2008 edition. And then a lot of this, based on this data, they were able to determine an empirical um, equation that you could then, based on your own system voltage, you could then um, apply a correction factor and then and then calculate the instant energy at your particular system voltage versus you know these these six voltages listed here or seven voltages listed in this table. So in comparing the 2002 edition and 2018 edition standards uh, with each other as far as what's required and what are some of your inputs and what are some exceptions, the 2002 edition basically was broken down into two separate branches. The first branch or the path they put you on was if the, uh, the system voltage was, was 1,000 volts or less than 1,000 volts, you would go down branch A, which would then take you through certain equations and you'd make some calculations. The second branch was if the system voltage was between 1,000 volts and 15 kV, then you would go down the, the second branch and, and then find your find your results. Um, you would then calculate the instant energy based on the, whichever branch you were on, and then you would then calculate the arc flash boundary. 2002 also introduced um, the 85% rule. Well, I believe that was a 2004 amendment that was included in 2002, but the 85% rule basically says once you calculate your arcing current and you have your instant energy and arc flash boundary, you need to recalculate the instant energy and arc flash boundary with an 85% arcing current from what was originally calculated. The reason being for that is that if you're right at the border on some settings, some protection settings, by dropping the arcing current by about 15%, you know, a fixed 15% to down to 85%, you can see if you would then transition, say, from an instantaneous setting that would pick up the arcing fault to a short time or from a short time to a long time. And that, that, actual, that extra duration that's, that's added based on the 85% rule could be significant when it comes to the overall available instant energy at that location. 2002 also had a 125 kVA transformer rule exception where if you had a uh, 125 kVA transformer or, that was, or something that was less than 125 kVA transformer that was providing equipment from an upstream position, then you could eliminate or not even perform the arc flash analysis for that downstream equipment that's connected to the 125 kVA transformer. 2002 also introduced a the two-second rule. It basically says that based on the configuration of the equipment and the enclosures and where the person's going to stand, if it's feasible or an engineering decision is made that it's feasible for a person to remove them, themselves away from the hazard or an, or an arc flash within two seconds, then the instant energy calculation can be cut off at two seconds, even if the circuit breaker or fuse or whatever the protective device is, you know, wouldn't operate for an hour or five hours or, or a week from the actual incident of the arc flash due to its installed protection settings. However, this one, one caveat there is that, you know, the engineering decision needs to understand, can somebody reasonably get away from the arc flash? Is, is there, are they in the side of vault where they can climb out? Are they in an open area where they can just easily run away? Are they in a, an enclosed area or a crowded area where there's just equipment around them and they might be pushed back or might be trapped up against a piece of equipment and they can't, and they actually can't, you know, remove themselves from the situation. So I advise everyone who's doing the arc flash and who actually uses the two second rule to, you know, be, be careful and understand some of the limitations of that two second rule. And 2018, some of the variables that are needed are, you know, listed here such as the electrode configuration, the open circuit voltage, bolted fault current, working distance, the arc duration, uh, which is the protective device operating time pretty much, you know, and some switching contact time or some, some switching time if there's an actual switch that actually operates, the conductor gap as well as enclosure size. And a lot of the enclosure size is listed in the standard 
are t- are the typical NEMA uh, NEMA size enclosures and typical gap distances for their for the voltage ratings. Uh, the 2018 edition removed the 85% rule and actually replaced it with the minimum arcing to current equation. So it's no longer a fixed 85%. Uh, based on the system information and the configuration, there's now a minimum arcing current equation that's needed to calculate that then gets put through the same um, rigor as the 85% current used to. There's uh, the 125 kVA transformer rule was also, or that exception, was also eliminated from the 2018 edition. But the two-second rule stayed, and it's actually in section 6.9.1. So now that we've kind of touched on the background a little bit, uh, let, let's go into some of the, the meat of the presentation and the, kind of the major changes and what those implications are from the 2002 to 2018 edition. So the, the 2018 edition introduces a, a, a major change, which is like a two-step calculation process. The first step being the intermediate calculations, and the second step being the final calculations. Uh, each of the intermediate sec- calculations require a, uh, a, a three-equation three calculation that takes into account some of the, like the electrode configuration and some of the coefficients that are found up in tables regarding, regarding to the certain voltage levels. And then the final calculation takes into account also some other correction factors that are used, you know, after applying to the intermediate the intermediate values for like enclosure box size and then arc current variation. Uh, basically, you calculate the the arcing current at the fixed the three fixed voltages, and then you interpolate and use a correction equation and correction factor to basically interpret to your actual system voltage. So say, you know, you calculate it at 600 volts, you would need to get that 600 volt result and interpolate it down to your 480 volt system. And this, this, is, this is done at, um, you know, intermediate values of average arc current, actually incident energy, and the arc flash boundary. So an, another major change that occurred in the 2018 edition is basically the improved accuracy of the, of the model. And that's based off of the approximate 1,700 additional tests that were performed between 2002 and 2018, uh, plus the 300 original for a total of about 2,000 uh, test points that form the basis of these new, newly defined or newly derived empirical equations that have then since been updated from 2002 to 2018 edition of the standard. Also, the, the accurate, the improved model, like the equations, they take into account additional factors that weren't in 2002 edition, such as the additional electrode configurations, uh, such as, you know, the enclosure sizes and having correction factors for that, and also that the voltage spectrum is now a continuous voltage spectrum versus just fixed set points. So whatever your voltage is, you can have a correction factor that'll, that'll more accurately or that improved accuracy will calculate the incident energy that's most appropriate for that voltage level. So speaking of the voltage spectrum um, and some of the other additions in the, in the model or changes in the model, uh, the model range has actually increased. And you can see from these two different columns, the, the red highlighting or the red text on the slide show a lot of the changes that occurred versus what happened prior um, in the 2002 edition. So in 2002, you know, the model was applicable from 208 volts to, to 15 kV three phase, you know, again, 50, 60 hertz, and the voltage fault current was from 700 amps to 106,000 amps. Um, and they also had a, you know, only it was equipment enclosures were commonly available sizes and the gaps between conductors were set between 13 millimeters and 152 millimeters. In 2018, you know, you still had that same 208 volt to 15 kV you know, three phase uh, voltages. You still had the same frequencies, but your bolted fault currents and the RMS symmetrical bolted faults ha- have changed. So instead of being from 700 to 106 K, about that whole spectrum, as you can see here from 208 volts to 600 volts, it's actually from 500 amps to 106 K, and yet from 601 volts to 15 kV, it goes as little as 200 amps to about 65 K. 
So that, that's, that's a substantial difference. And the gaps between the conductors has also changed. So you can kind of see the different ranges based on um, those were the red text there between 208 and 600 and then 601 and 15 kV as compared to the 2002 edition. The working distances again are, are greater than or equal to 305 millimeters so 12 inches greater than 12 inches and the fault clearing time didn't have a limit in 2018 and then we've also added the electrode configurations and the enclosure dimension limits you know in this model. As I stated earlier, the 2002 edition had basically two equations that were based on, you know, two voltage ranges. One was less than 1,000 volts, the other one was between 1,000 volts and 15 kV. Um, in 2018, there's, there's three, three equations for three voltage ranges, you know, for like the intermediate equations. And those ranges are 600 volts, 2.7 kV, and 15 kV. And then you need to calculate each of these equations because in the final values, you know, the, these, or the minimum currents, these equations are needed in that next step process. And then there's some guidance based on whatever voltage you have on which of those final equations you use as your final arc and current. And like I said earlier, the final results require interpolation to scale to the actual system voltage if it differs from these three voltage ranges. So next, one of the major changes and actual additions is the electrode configuration. Um, in 2018, there's five different electrode configurations that were tested. Uh, it's also known as it's Table 9 in 2000 and, and IEEE 1584, 2018. And these five electrode configurations uh, the first one is VCV, which is vertical conductors or electrodes inside a metal box or enclosure. And VCB was included in the 2002 edition. Uh, VCBB is vertical conductors, electrodes terminated in an insulating barrier inside a metal box and enclosure, uh, which is new. HCB, which is also new, is horizontal conductors, in, you know, electrodes inside a metal box or an enclosure. VOA, which is also which was included in 2002, is um, vertical conductors in open air. So VOA, vertical open air, and, um, and like I said, it was in 2002. And then HOA, which is new, is same as VOA, but it's horizontal conductors in open air. And that was added in 2018. And some pictorial representations of, of these conductors are shown below with what basically they stand for um, VCB, VCBB, VH, uh, HCB, VOA, and HOA. It kind of shows you in the bottom of um, pictorially what each of those configurations look like. And these photographs were taken directly from uh, from IEEE 1584, so you can you can actually find these photographs in the standard itself. So we just saw the uh, pictorial diagrams that are presented, or the cartoon diagrams that are presented in, um, in IEEE 1584. But what, what do these installations really look like in the, in the field? If you look at the top left photograph, that is a VCB installation, and it's highlighted in the, by the red circle. So that's the load side of a circuit breaker where the cables terminate into it on the bottom side, and there's no barrier right at that connection point. In the bottom left photograph, there's the VC, VCBB installation, which is the same circuit breaker, you know, but the, the cables are now terminating, in, terminating into the top side of the breaker, or you know, the line side of the breaker. And because of the breaker there itself, the per breaker itself provides a barrier, so that would be a VCBB installation. The middle photograph is an example of an HCB installation because you have the conductors coming out facing toward the person they're standing right next to it. And that's how shown in the, the red dotted circle as well. And the upper right photograph is the VOA installation, which is the vertical open air. And you can see these conductors are installed vertically and they're, they're not in an enclosure, so it's open air. And in the bottom right photograph, there is the HOA installation, which basically shows you know horizontal open air. So these are, could be you know stabs or connection pads from a transformer 
or some other device like a circuit breaker potentially that actually has the conductors facing or pointing toward the individual standing next to it. And I just want to mention that each of these photographs were taken directly from the IEEE 1584 2018 edition and actually are included in the standard. So if you wanted to go write some, see some of the commentary on these, on these photographs, uh, please refer to that standard. So here's an example of an installation that you know could have multiple electrical configurations where you would need to calculate the arcing current and the instant energy based on these different electrode configurations. So here showing is this VCB or is this HCB? If you look at the, the blue circled area where the blue line's pointing, where the blue arrow's pointing to, uh, VCB shown because it's a vertical conductor that's not going into a, uh, it's not open air and it's not going into a, uh, an, a barrier. So it's a VCB installation. While it also has an HCB installation because of these, uh, these stabs that the that the the device connects into, and you know that that's a pretty pretty large difference between the two. So I just want to say that a couple different you know electro configurations could change based on actually how it's installed. So that's very important information to gather when performing these arc flash studies. Here's another example of of a single installation that may have multiple different types of uh, uh, electro configurations, which then again makes things a little more confusing. Uh, the photograph on the left shows a VCB configuration, and it's basically the, the load conductors exiting the circuit breaker. Uh, the middle, middle photograph is a VCBB electro configuration as the conductors or the cables enter the top of the breaker, and you have that top of that breaker as, a, as an insulating barrier. And then if you look on the right photograph, there's the, the, the screws or the... Um, the screw terminals that you can actually, you know, screw the, uh, at the connection points, you can, you know, screw in the cables that connect to the bottom of the breaker. And because those, those screws are live and exposed, they're actually touching, you know, the live energized cable. So that would also be an HCB configuration. So again, which one do you choose? And the best way is to, to choose all three and, and calculate for all three, which, which is why the, you know, the use of commercial software is very beneficial and very helpful in this, in this sense to, to speed up some of these arc flash studies because that's a number of calculations you can do at you know thousands of different, different points in the system. Because each of these electro configurations or each installation may have multiple types of electro configurations in a single panel, or a single single enclosure, the question may become next is well, which one's worst case? And if I don't do one, am I underestimating the instant energy? Or if I do one, am I overestimating the instant energy? Where we can actually have a, a much lower value so that the person may not have to wear a category three or four uh, PPE requirements and maybe only category one or two. So uh, I triply looked at it and here, here's a plot of different configurations along with uh, you know VCB and VOA and then a lot of the, the, the new values that, that were occurring. The, the, the dotted lines in this were from the 2002 equations while, or the test, while the other lines, the non-dotted lines, are, the, are from the new 2018. And if you look, the, the, the largest or the most severe would be the um, HCB, so it would be the horizontal conductors in a box. That is the red line on the top, followed by VCBB and HOA, or, you know, horizontal open air. So those are likely, those are your most severe, and then, then you go by, then the dotted line is the VCB, and um, the new VCB is the blue line. And as you go down farther and farther, you also have the vertical open air. So the vertical open air is probably the, is the least severe based on this, this graph, followed by the VCB, is the next least severe. And the one that's really important is if there is a HCB configuration, that's something you definitely want to look at and include in your arc flash study because that could significantly change the instant energy calculations as shown by this plot. So one of the other additional major changes was the equipment class or the enclosure size. Uh, these two different tables here are both actually produced in 
the 2018 edition of IEEE 1584, but as you can tell from their titles, one is relevant from the 2002 edition, and the other one is the 2018 edition. And the 2018 edition has a number of additional enclosures and enclosure sizes. So I just wanted to point out that a lot of an addition, additional closure sizes were taken into account when performing these 1,700 additional tests. And because of that, you know, the, these equations are, uh, the empirical data suggests that they are much more accurate than what was, what occurred in the 2002 edition. And this actually shows you, like, the different uh, default bus gaps and closure sizes based on what type of equipment class there is. So this is useful information when performing your, your, your updated 2018 edition R flash study. So in summary, the uh, equations have become much more complex than they were in the 2002 edition. Calculations, you know, each of these equations, you need to perform calculations at three different voltage levels, 600 volts, 2.7 kV, 14.3 kV, and then you interpolate to your actual system voltage, um, both in intermediate and you got to do it, you know, in final. Um, coefficients are, that are provided in these more complex equations or these longer equations are provided in lookup tables for use in the three voltage level equations and are based on the actual test data. So they were empiric empirically de derived and statistically derived based on the, the test data. If you use a commercial software to do this, a lot of the commercial software programs have these coefficients based on your voltage settings already pre-programmed. So, you know, you may not actually have to look up the, the coefficients, but if you wanted to do hand calculations to verify the software calculations, then uh, that's, this is how you would do it. So the next thing we wanted to talk about was a, uh, an application comparison. So a model application comparison between 2002 and 2018. So this is a, uh, the summary of the model application that is presented in 2002 and in 2018. And if you see, look, uh, and compare the two, uh, they are exactly the same. Um, basically, the steps are the same. It's just the, the to complete the steps and the, the inner um, inner details or the working details in each of these steps has changed. So in both both editions, you were to determine the arcing current, then determine the arc duration or fault clearing time based on the arcing current. That then gives you the ability to calculate the incident energy which then allows you to determine the arc flash boundary. And then you need to repeat the first four steps again for the reduced uh, arcing current. Um, so that, you know, in 2002, that was the 85% rule. 2018 is the minimum arcing current calculation that you'd have to perform. So you, once you know that, you then recycle it back into steps, you know, two, three, and four to, uh, because you would have that minimum arcing current. So in general, you know, 2002, 2018, the the outcomes of each of these steps are pretty much the same, but the process in determining those outcomes has changed. So diving into each of these item one through five in a little more detail, uh, you can really start to see the differences between the two different codes. I haven't put very much equations on here, or really any equations except for a few slides, um, mainly because the equations are are pretty but pretty long and it would it would extend this this presentation quite significantly uh, but all the equations are actually in the in the standard and they tell you list by you know step by step what to do so it's a great way to follow and, and there's a summary in, in the standard to tell you you know how you go about calculating and how you determine the instant energy um, so looking at two looking at 2002 basically you know step one is determine the arcing current and there's in 2002, there's three things you need to look at. For system voltages less than 1 kV, they say use equation 1. For system voltages greater than 1 kV or equal to 1 kV, use equation 2. And then also calculate 85% of, of the arcing current that you determine in, in steps A or B. Um, and that'll be used in step 5. In 2018, you still need to determine the arcing current, but there's a number of things you have to do before that. First off, you need to determine the equipment electrode configuration. So that's your HCB, your H, HOA, VCB, VCCB, 
in VOA uh, electrode configurations. And then you need to look at to see if the system voltage is uh, between 600 volts and 15 kV. And if so, use equation one for the intermediate arcing current. Uh, you then need to use equations 16, 17, and 18 to find the final value of arcing current, which takes into account some of the correction factors. And then uh, step C, if the system voltage is between 208 volts and 600 volts, you still need to use equation one for the intermediate arcing current. But instead of using equation 16, 17, 18 for the final value, you use equation 25, which is a little simpler uh, than 16, 17, 18 to find the final value of arcing current. So once the uh, arc, arcing current has been determined, the next step is to determine the arc duration or the fault clearing time. And this is basically a uh, review of the protection settings and maybe reviewing some TCCs or time current curves to determine how long it'll take at the calculated arcing current to, to clear the arcing current. Um, these steps are very similar. And in 2018, they, uh, there's an additional section that says C section 6.9.1 for further guidance. So once the uh, arcing current and arc duration or fault clearing time are known, um, you then need to determine and calculate the incident energy. Uh, in 2002, basically there was, you know, these three steps listed here. Step A was to find the normalized incident energy using equations four and five. And then step B was to take that normalized energy and convert it to a final incident energy by using equation six. Um, and for voltages that are greater than 15 kV, uh, 1584, 2002 edition, uh, recommended using the Lee method, which was equation seven. And I won't go into details on the Lee method, but um, that was kind of how, how it was done in, 2000 and, in 2002. In 2018, uh, the next step you need to do is determine the enclosure size correction factor. So this is where your enclosure size um, really comes into play. Back in the, when you determine the arcing current, it was the electrode configuration, but now it's the enclosure size because there's there are different uh, instant energies are, that are based on the enclosure size. And similar as into the arcing current, the next step is if your system voltage is between 600 volts and 15 kV, it says use equations three, four, and five to find the intermediate values. And then you follow that up by using equations 19, 20, 21, and the guidance in section 4.9 to find the final incident energy value. And But if your system voltage is between 208 and 600 volts, and the open circuit voltage it says use equation six. So equation six, um, a little, little simpler, and then uh, guidance for the final incident energy is provided in section 4.10. So if you're doing calculations at a 480 volt system, your incident energy calculation would be a little bit simpler than if you you know, did calculations at a medium voltage system or something above 600 volts. And then there's some other, other language in the, the, in the standard that says additional considerations should be evaluated and some other guidance has been provided in section 6.10. So once the uh, incident energy has been determined, like I said, the next step is to determine the arc flash boundary. And in 2002, the arc flash boundary was determined by a set, you know, a simple, simple equation for, for different voltage levels. The first one was for, it was based on the empirically derived data that was taken, that was less than 15 kV. And it says use equation eight. For the lead method or voltages that are greater than 15 kV, you know, use equation nine. In 2018, to determine the arc flash boundary, you need to look into section 4.8, which gives you guidance on the enclosure size correction factor. And then based on that, you would then perform a calculation. If your system voltage was between 600 volts and 15 kV, you would then use equation seven, eight, and nine to find those intermediate values. And then you would then use equation 22, 23, and 24 and the guidance in section 4.9 to find the final arc flash boundary values. So it's very similar to the incident energy calculations where you need the enclosure size correction factor. And if the system voltage is again between 208 volts and 600 volts, we would use equation 10. Um, additional guidance is provided in section 4.10 for the final arc flash boundary calculation. 
And now the, the final step in you know, completing the instant energy analysis at one particular location would be to repeat steps one through four that we just discussed for the reduced arcing current. So in 2002, it was just run, rerun the same calculations with the arcing current reduced at 85% of the calculated value. While in 2018, you would need to use the guidance in section 4.5 for arcing current variation, which is equation two. So it's no longer, like I said earlier, it's no longer the 85% arcing current value. It is now, you now need to calculate to determine the lower bound of the average RMS arcing current. And that equation is actually shown here in, this, in the bottom left by I arc min. And it's, you know, and there's also a variable or a correction factor is the arcing current variation correction factor. So that's all plays into calculating the I arc min. And then that I arc min is then used as an input into the same equations from uh, steps two, three, and four. You wouldn't do step one because you've already calculated the, the arcing current. Um, and now you're going to repeat steps two, three, and four with the minimum arcing current based on this equation. And if you're looking for examples on calculations, uh, 1584, 2018 edition, Annex D, D as in, as in dog, has um, two different examples. Uh, there's a 480 volt example, which actually runs through the, the, the inputs, and then it goes through each calculation, and then it makes determinations on what the instant energy would be. And then there's also an example in, um, for 40, for 4.16 kV or 4160. Uh, volts, and that example kind of goes through a median voltage example as well. So those are some two very important calculation examples that allows you to follow the steps that I just kind of covered from steps one through five, and allows you to see you know what was made, what was included, and where they got the data from. So I encourage everyone when you're doing these arc flash calculations to actually run through these example calculations before you do a uh, an, an actual client or customer calculation just to, uh, if you haven't done it before, to get your feet wet and to understand where everything's coming from. So in closing of this presentation, I wanted to kind of just go over again the, the takeaways or the, the learning points um, from the very beginning of the presentation. And the overarching one is that the 1584 or 2018 edition standard has changed significantly from the 2002 edition. While the outcomes and some of the the steps are the same. The how you go through those steps and how you get those intermediate outcomes have changed significantly, uh, partly due to the the change in the equations. And the more accurate equations and more complex, based on you know more available test data and the statistical analysis that was performed on that test data, as well as the need to gather additional information as inputs into the the 2018 edition arc flash study versus those inputs were not available in the 2002 uh, arc flash study. So with those takeaways, I'd like to open up the presentation now, or I would like to invite some questions. Um, before I do that, though, I would like to thank Grace for inviting me to give this presentation. And like, again, I'd like to thank everyone for attending this presentation. Hopefully it was informative and it kind of gave you some guidance on how to perform these calculations now and and what else, what other additional information you may need um, to gather to perform these calculations. So with that, thank you very much. Um, you can find my contact information if you just do an internet search for my name and then append that with Exponent. Uh, a lot of my, my emails and telephone numbers and stuff are, are provided on that website. So thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions.